this episode, I'm speaking to astrophysicist Dr. Becky Smethurst about black holes, their role in the evolution of galaxies, and how new observatories like JWST can help us unlock their secrets. Hi, my name's Dr. Becky Smethurst, and I am an astrophysicist from the University of Oxford. Cool. Yeah, thanks Thanks for joining me on the podcast today. Becky, it's, it's great to have you on. The reason our, pa- our paths have crossed is because of your, your latest book, which is Brief History of Black Holes, which is uh, pretty cool, pretty pretty exciting topic. Mm-hmm. My favourite topic, personally, as well. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm very excited. I'm sure you're going to get uh, uh, asked this a lot when, when you're sort of um, speaking about the book, but I did think it was worth going mm-hmm. back to basics. What is a black hole? <laughs> yeah, I think, I mean, if I could change anything in all of physics, it would probably be the word for a black hole or the name for a black hole because I think it has so many misconceptions sort of attributed to it. Obviously, we describe a black hole very simply as an object that is so dense that not even light traveling at 300,000 kilometers a second has enough speed to escape it because gravity is so strong the pull from it. And I like to describe them as more like um, like a dark star than a hole like banish the idea of a hole in space from your from your brain it's a very like take a star and collapse it down squish it down till until it's so dense that you know you're no longer getting any light from it at all was it quite a quite a daunting topic to write a book about was it sort of one of those topics where you're sort of like where do i start <laughs> a little bit yeah but i think the ma- the main guiding force for this whole book was that it was really looking at our history of understanding of black holes sort of where the idea comes from, how we even figured out that they exist in the first place, our first observations of them, building up to what we know now and what we still don't know. So I think it was easy in that respect because almost where do you start is when we knew nothing, you know, about them at all. And it, was, it wasn't it was even sort of a blink in anybody's eye, the idea of a black hole. So uh, that's where I sort of started from was where did the first ideas of black holes come from? And it comes from way back in the 1700s, which I think always surprises people that uh, that's how long ago we're talking about. And then sort of through the ideas of Einstein's theories of general relativity, explaining Einstein never even thought black holes existed, which I think, again, surprises a lot of people. And then sort of through the work of radio astronomy and x-ray astronomy coming into the the fore sort of after world war ii sort of when technology had massively improved and we had the ability to send satellites into space as well you know x-ray light good for us on earth in the fact that it doesn't reach the surface <laughs> life is probably quite thankful for that but if you're an x-ray astronomer it's really annoying because it means if you want to observe the sky in x-rays you have to send a satellite above the atmosphere um so this is sort of one of the reasons why our knowledge on black holes is still quite young there's still so much that we don't know so while the history can you know really sort of illuminate where this idea came from and why we think some things and why we don't think others it also allows us to reveal you know what is still left for us to know as well yeah it's really interesting the stuff you were saying there about einstein because i I definitely think that's certainly a misconception you sort of think people sort of think it's something that Einstein came up with, and we only recently discovered mm. it. But you're saying it goes back to the 1700s. It must have just been very, very basic theory. <laughs> yeah, so it was a chap called John Mitchell, who was a priest by day and astronomer by night. One of those classic things <laughs> from sort of um, early sort of science and everything. Uh, and he just came up with the idea that, you know, an object's so dense that light couldn't escape it. He was musing on the ideas of gravity, stuff like this. Um, But yeah, Einstein, when he came up with general relativity as a way of explaining gravity as mass curving space, he was just trying to solve problems like why Mercury's orbit is strange, why we can't always predict it with Newton's gravity, stuff like this. Um, And he never even considered the concept of a black hole. Even Schwarzschild, who uh, wrote letters with Einstein through World War II as well, solving his equations uh, for you know, in spherical coordinates so that you get almost the solutions for a black hole, never even realized what he'd found almost or even that it was something that was real it was all hypothetical it was all mathematical and it wasn't until the likes of Stephen Hawking and Roger Penrose in the late 60s proved that actually these things would be inevitable in nature that that, uh, the idea of a collapse down to something so massive with this singularity and where light couldn't escape from them you know that idea really came into the forefront of proper sort of theoretical physicists minds but I'm an observer, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm like, oh, give me a telescope. I want to actually observe these things. And like most people through the 70s, that was sort of, well, OK, yeah, you've shown the maths is right. But we're not going to find one of these things. Are you sure they're really real? And, uh, and then that's where the book really goes into that sort of observational hunt for things as well. And I think, yeah, people don't realize the, the 
the centuries and decades worth of research that goes into figuring out these things. Can we pinpoint a, a specific observation that was the point at which we said, yeah, they, they definitely exist? Yeah, definitely. In, in, in the 70s, whether people want spoilers or not, but <laughs> it's probably Cygnus X1 was a, a sort of a black hole in our own Milky Way galaxy that was, uh, you know, formed from a, a supernova at the end of their life. Again, it was one of those things where at the time it was unexplained. And one of the sort of last lines almost of the discussion of the research paper that announced its discovery was, well, it might be a black hole. <laughs> so, you know, has anybody thought about this? And um, and that's sort of wonderful to see as well as that sort of tentative uh, sort of discussion of something that you now know to be true. And the funny thing is, it, it was only the, the term black hole had only, only just been sort of come into common use at that time as well right before sort of the first ob observation of one as well finding one um before that they were called gccos gravitationally completely collapsed objects which i'm kind of glad that didn't stick uh, astronomers we, we like to put acronyms on everything right so i'm really glad that i'm not going around oh i've re researched gccos um, <laughs> but yeah you know even hawking in his, in his papers in the 60s wasn't referring to them as black holes but only at the early start of the 70s was it sort of in uh, commas, you know, black holes, um, which is nice to see. And I talk about that in the book as well, sort of the etymology of that phrase and where it came from. Yeah, I mean, I really like that uh, the uh, book subtitle, which is um, and why nearly everything you know about them is wrong. Um, it's obviously yeah. <laughs> you're obviously like uh, uh, addressing these um, misconceptions about black holes. I, I suppose mm. one of them is can we really say that they're black? Because when we look at a, an image of a galaxy and you see you see that bright core, mm. you, you hear astronomers say that's because of the black hole at the center, which obviously seems like a bit of a bit sort of contradictory, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah, it is. And uh, to be honest, uh, so I have two chapters in the book. One's called Why Black Holes Are Black, and one's called Why Black Holes Aren't Black. <laughs> <laughs> black meaning, obviously, this idea that you trap light away, and that's where the idea of a black hole comes from. But actually, they are some of the brightest objects in the entire universe, at least. So they, they, you know, the reason we know that they're there is because they light up like Christmas trees everywhere in, this, in the centers of galaxies and dotted across galaxies as well. And that's because because they are so massive, when material starts to fall towards them, it gets accelerated to huge speeds. If you're going at a huge speed, you probably have a very high temperature as well, and you start to glow. So, you know, like in the in the same sense, if you, you heat metal in a fire, right, in a forge, and it, it starts to glow. It's a similar thing, right? You, you start to glow not just across visible light that we can see, but also ultraviolet, X-ray, you start getting some radio emission in there as well because of these very fast-moving particles. So... They do light up like Christmas trees and show themselves off. And the bigger the black hole, the brighter as well that it can get to. So yeah, when we look into the centers of galaxies and we see the supermassive black holes that are anywhere from a million up to you know 10 billion or so times the mass of the sun, these things really do shine so brightly that when they were first discovered, they were thought to be stars. It was why they were called quasi-stellar objects because they looked like stars. But in reality, they were supermassive black holes in the centers of galaxies billions of light years away so far that the telescopes we had at the time couldn't see the stars in the galaxy because they were so faint but the x-ray telescopes could pick up the immense amount of light that was coming from the center of them so i mean if you think about it like that they can outshine hundreds of billions of stars in galaxies it's it's quite incredible it's incredible, isn't it? But obviously that light it isn't being produced at the point at which it wouldn't be able to escape. Exactly. No, yeah. So you have, you know, lots of different sort of circles you can draw around black holes. One of them is what we call the event horizon, which is the point that you would have to be traveling faster than the speed of light to escape it. And the light that is being released is essentially coming from, you know, a few event horizons out, essentially, where the light can still escape and the material that's swirling around it, we can still see the glow from it, essentially. Um, and it's by studying black holes in great detail, sort of drilling down to that event horizon, if we can, that we understand more and more about the extremes of gravity and, and, how, so, and how light and material and everything like that is behaving around them. Yeah, the, there, was a, there was this other aspect of of that, the this, this sort of almost contradictory, seemingly contradictory nature of them. And it's these the, these jets that seem to blast out from, yeah. from, from black holes. <laughs> what's, what's going on there? <laughs> Yeah, well, I mean, we understand these even less, right? But the, the working hypothesis is that 
The material around the supermassive black holes or any black hole gets so hot that you end up separating out the electrons that are zooming around the atom uh, from the very nucleus of the atom. Electrons are negatively charged, the nucleus of an atom is positively charged. So you have charged moving particles. And if people remember their, you know, <laughs> high school physics, <laughs> you might remember that charged moving particles give you a magnetic field. So then you've got this magnetic field that's also uh, competing with the gravitational field around the black hole as well. So you have some incredibly turbulent atmospheres going on around this black hole, essentially. And magnetic fields can also funnel charged particles as well. And we think that's what happens somehow is that these charged particles get funneled up this magnetic field and essentially expelled from like the poles of the magnetic field, like almost like the North and South Pole in these huge jets that can be ejected at close to the speed of light as well. So it's almost kind of like a, uh, a big sort of high energy radiation <laughs> just sort of ray gun almost just firing away from these black holes. And they can be bigger than galaxies themselves. So the way I had this described to me when I was a grad student was that if you imagine sort of the palm of your hand, the black hole might be the size of the atom in the very center. The galaxy of stars is a grain of sand and the jets from the supermassive black hole can extend across the full extent of your of your palm. Oh, that's awesome, isn't it? Which is insane, <laughs> right? It, yeah, it's absolutely insane thinking the scales involved. And so one of the things that we think that these jets can do is because they're incredibly energetic, is actually put energy back into the galaxy, stir everything up essentially, heat up a lot of the hydrogen gas in the galaxy which prevents new stars from being formed because you need cold gas to make new stars because you need the molecules to be moving very slowly so that gravity has a hope of clumping them together to make them dense enough to, to make a star. But if those molecules are moving very, very fast because they've had this injection of energy, then they can resist sort of gravity trying to make this very under-dense hydrogen into a star, essentially. So we think that if you feed the black hole set up this disk of incredibly hot material around it that sets a magnetic field you get these jets you're eventually you're essentially you know the galaxy's shooting itself in the foot <laughs> basically it, it's killing itself almost um by stopping itself from making new stars and all that it's left to do is just sort of have its current ones die off slowly over billions of years yes isn't this this is one of the um key aspects of your research isn't it this this, new, this sort of star mm, star formation yes. in galaxies and is it, is it star formation in galaxies in, in terms of how black holes influence and affect that process? Yeah, it was funny. So I got into this because we wanted to understand how do galaxies stop forming stars? How do they die, essentially? Um, I was studying this in my PhD as a function of sort of what shape is the galaxy? Um, do beautiful spiral shapes, you know, end their lives differently to big blob elliptical galaxies, um, sort of big spheres of stars? And... The more and more I looked into this, the more I was like, well, we have to surely control for the supermassive black hole at the center. <laughs> and that literally sent me down the rabbit hole <laughs> of black holes um, into the point where, yes, you have to understand all of these sort of external processes happening to galaxies from two things merging together or interacting with something else or whatever it might be. But once you've understand that, I think it's almost like all roads lead to Rome, all roads lead to the black hole at the center of the galaxy is, is the thing that's going to have the biggest impact. And it's also the thing that we still don't have proper evidence for happening yet. So that process that I described, it has to happen in our simulations of the universe. Otherwise, they don't match what we find in the observed universe. That's the thing we have to add to make them match. But we've never found observation evidence for that actually happening across, you know, entire galaxy populations. And it could be like a timing thing. It could be that the black hole is giving out these jets for such a short amount of time that you can't correlate it with it then dying off, which takes much longer, like the galaxy dying off. Um, it's a very difficult sort of thing to unpack and unpiece. And so we're sort of trying to drill down, sort of no longer taking one image of a galaxy and treating it like one big entity and saying what's going on in that thing we're now looking at them almost as if they're jigsaw puzzles and we're taking tiny little observations of one section and mosaicing it you know, with the rest of the galaxy and saying, okay, so distance from the supermassive black hole in the center, does that look different to outside? Can you find these jets from the black hole? And is there some sort of pattern along the jet where that's having an impact now? 
um, that you don't see elsewhere in the galaxy. Things like this that we're trying to get at what is actually happening uh, and what is actually affecting these galaxies and stopping them from, from forming stars eventually. What, what sort of observatories and telescopes mm. are you actually able to use to, to help you in your quest? <laughs> Well, thankfully for me, I study fairly nearby galaxies. So <laughs> they're quite pretty, first of all, because you can see their nice shapes. Um, but also it means that we can use ground-based telescopes as well. So the likes of the Isaac Newton telescope um, on the Palmer uh, in the Canary Islands, uh, the Very Large Telescope in Chile as well, uh, with one of the instruments called Muse on there. We've used uh, the Shane 3 meter in, in Lick, in, uh, just outside of San Francisco, um, San Jose in California. Uh, so a various, uh, couple of different instruments, all really with the focus of getting what's called a spectra, where you take the light from the galaxy and you split it through a prism and you essentially get this trace of how much light of each wavelength are you receiving. And the goal with that is to observe the hydrogen that is emitting light at the exact same wavelength as it orbits the black hole because it orbits the black hole some of that hydrogen is moving away from you and some of it is moving towards you and so as that hydrogen emits light of a specific wavelength or color it gets red shifted and blue shifted in a doppler shift in the same way that you know an ambulance racing towards you will have its uh, the pitch of its sound uh, it will increase and as it race to, races away from you the pitch of that sound it gives out will decrease it's a similar thing so if you take the light from the galaxy and you split it through this prism and get this trace of how much light at each wavelength, you expect this giant big sort of spike of a peak at the light wavelength that hydrogen emits at. But instead what you find is this big sort of broadened bell shape because of the fact that the light is spiraling around the black hole. And the amount of broadening depends on how fast the hydrogen gas is moving, which depends on how massive the supermassive black hole is. So you can, first of all, use that to work out, okay, well, how massive is the supermassive black hole? And then from how bright the hydrogen gas is, you can work out well, how much is there around the supermassive black hole. So how much material is it taking in? And then these outflows or jets that are given out from the black hole, they then impact things like oxygen that's in sort of the surrounding gas in the galaxy, which takes an incredible amount of energy to ionize, to remove one of the uh, electrons from the around the outsides so that it can uh, encourage one of those electrons to jump up to the next energy level, drop back down and then, and then give out light. Uh, and then again, we can then detect that in the spectrum of light. And from the amount of light there, we know how much oxygen is shining. We therefore know how much energy has been given out. So then you have, okay, this is how big the black hole is. This is how much material it's currently taking in. This is how much material it's currently spewing out from this region around it, not the black hole itself, but from the region around it. And then you can say, okay, well, how many stars are in that location? What colors are they? What, how, how much hydrogen emission are they giving off? Therefore, how many stars are currently forming there? And you can start to piece everything together and link everything together. So even though you can't see the black hole itself, you can see all of the influence around it, even in optical light as well, which I think is, is incredible that we can do that and also that we've managed to piece together everything we needed to know from quantum mechanics and chemistry and optics and <laughs> astronomy from over the years to be able to do that. Yeah, it's, it's really interesting that all these methods of observing and, and studying a, a black hole are, are so indirect. Is there actually actually any way of directly observing a black hole? Yeah, I mean, I guess the most direct way is not with light at all, it's with gravitational waves. So with the LIGO detectors and the Virgo detectors, as they detect the gravitational waves from the merger of two black holes. So this is sort of, you know, they're orbiting around each other and constantly changing how much space is bent and warped by their mass, and warping it to the extreme and back constantly. Uh, you send out these these ripples into space, essentially, that uh, increase in their magnitude as the black holes get closer and closer and closer together. And with that, I think that's the most direct way of observing the black holes themselves. But also, you know, in that sense, we're, we're, we're still observing the effects on them on space itself. So it's a weird one because it almost is a it's the most direct we can get, but it's still technically an indirect effect. <laughs> How did you feel about these, the um, recent, uh, I mean, one more recent than the other, the, the two uh, Event Horizon Telescope um, mm. images of uh, the black hole in M87, and then more recently, the, the supermassive black hole at the centre of our own galaxy? What was your reaction when they came out? And what are they sort of showing us? 
I mean, reaction was just disbelief. Like I remember the thing that got me into astronomy was this book I had as an eight-year-old kid, which was, it was beautiful. Uh, it had all these illustrations and pictures, you know, from Hubble Space Telescope inside of it, like one page for every planet with a little fact file. I devoured it. And I would tell anybody I could, you know, that, about this book. And I remember the last page was about black holes. And there was no nice image on that page because... It was, it, was like, it was like the late 90s, right? We, had, we didn't have anything that we could necessarily show. So it was always an artist impression. I think even as I got into research, I'd resigned myself to the fact that we would always ever have an artist impression. We would never have a true image of, of necessarily a black hole. So when those images got released, I, and I say disbelief, it really was disbelief. Like I knew that they were trying to do it, but I didn't think that we would quite get what we got where you can see this very clear shadow of the black hole in the center where you're no longer getting any light. And the thing that gives me the, just like the goosebumps the most thinking about those images is you obviously have this big orange donut, which is, uh, you know, as it's been called, this is a ring of the material spiraling around the black hole that's giving out all the radio emission that's been detected. And then you've got the black on the inside, which is the black hole where there's no light. And then you've got the black on the outside where there's no light. The black on the outside is empty space. It's literally nothing at all. The black on the inside is everything, right? It's billions worth of sun's matter crushed and crushed down. And when you think about the difference between those two black patches on those images, I, it, it's just, it's so hard to comprehend. And I never thought we'd be able to almost see that, that difference in it before so getting those was amazing and obviously all of the sort of tests of general relativity we've been able to do with them is is really you know what what these whole images were for yes they look very pretty but at the same time they allow us to do proper science and all the tests we've done show yeah general relativity comes out on top all the time you know that we that we've not missed anything you know closer to the black hole where gravity goes to its extreme and that was always sort of the the People have always wondered whether that was the case because we've never been able to test it in those areas before to say, have we got something wrong? Do we need some sort of correction in those extreme cases? And this is what the Event Horizon Telescope is going to do in the future as well, is that they're adding more and more telescopes to the big array because it's essentially lots of little telescopes all around the world that it um, brings together to make an Earth-sized telescope to be able to see this level of detail. They're adding more and more telescopes at shorter radio wavelengths. So you can get closer and closer down to that event horizon near the black hole as well. And they're doing it over multiple epochs. So a lot of the data we saw was taken in 2017. There's been more observing runs since then as well of M87 and Sagittarius A star in the middle of uh, the Milky Way. And they're going to try and see how the material around the black hole changes with time as well. And almost make a, a movie, if you will, a time lapse of how this gas around the supermassive black hole is changing, which would be incredible to see, you know, and thinking back to, you know, eight year old me going, oh, we're always going to have an artist impression mm. to we might have a time lapse <laughs> of stuff around a black hole is is amazing. Yeah, um, it, it sort of it reminds you of Hubble. Hubble returns back to something you know, like like the Pillars mm. of Creation 20 years later and, and how much it's improved. It's yeah. sort of a bit like that, isn't it? Yeah, or even like when it goes back to some of the supernova that are like ring nebula, planetary nebula now, and you almost see the ring expand uh, from sort of like five years gap in between. Yeah, it's it's going to be something like that and I don't think we're ready for it. <laughs> yeah, um, I, I suppose um, it's it, it's worth touching on JWST and 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 yeah. sort of up- upcoming observatories like the, the Square Kilometre Array organization. How do you hope that they'll contribute to our understanding of black holes? I mean, uh, with JWST, it's all about probing deeper and deeper to further and fainter things in the universe. And for me, that means answering what I like to dub the astrophysical equivalent of the chicken or the egg, um, mm. which was, does, did the galaxy come first or did the black hole come first? <laughs> Um, so, you know, did the black hole at the center of the galaxy, you know, form out of gas in the universe and then a galaxy of stars form around it? Or did a galaxy of stars form, one of them go supernova, form a fairly smallish black hole, and then that grew to be supermassive and ended up being the heaviest thing in the galaxy and sinking to the center? We don't know at the moment. And with JWST, we're hoping to peer back to some of those first stars that ever formed. So yeah, you know, when people hear that, oh, you know, see the first stars and first galaxies, people get excited. And I'm like, yeah, well, now we'll know the order of, of what of what came first as well. Because if you do have a supermassive black hole that somehow manages to collapse 
from just pure gas in the early universe skip star entirely and collapse down to say 10,000 times the mass of the sun black hole from a big gas dense gas cloud that's going to leave some effects right what's to stop that gas cloud to stopping it collapsing into stars well if there's a lot of stars formed nearby that are irradiating it with say ultraviolet light then it's going to be too hot to form stars but if the universe was denser back then it could be that that gas is still able to be brought together and it would just collapse straight down so we're hoping to see, maybe see these gas clouds that are being irradiated that are very, very hot and have very large masses that could be perhaps the sort of the precursors to the first black holes. And we've had some tantalizing hints from Hubble, but again, it, it, it's not got the ability to get that sort of um, high resolution data and also high signal to noise data that we need from those very distant parts. So that's something I'm looking forward to JWST looking at is is sort of this order of of, of what th- of how things happen. But SKA as well with the with the radio uh, sort of obse- observations that SKA will do, and that's going to peer back and look at again like what's the distribution of hydrogen in those very early times in the universe because it looks for emission from hydrogen at 21 centimeters wavelength in the radio regime it's one of the most common sort of emissions that you see across the universe it allowed us to for example map out the structure of our galaxy from the inside as well sort of where all the hydrogen gas was but you can also look at it at that incredible distance with the ska as well and we might be able to find these clumps of you know 10,000 times the mass of the sun worth of hydrogen gas that's just sat there in the early universe, what's going to happen to it? You know, if you find evidence for that, then that sort of gives an idea that these what we call direct collapse black holes actually exist because the only way of that we know to make a black hole now is a supernova and it only makes something like 10 times the mass of the sun. There's literally not enough time to grow something from 10 times the mass of the sun to a billion times the mass of the sun in only say a billion years which is when we start to see these first quasars that are that massive as well so there must be some sort of other process that we don't know that forms a black hole like these direct collapse in the early universe that hopefully JWST and SK will spy and shed some light on. Absolutely yeah I mean it's, it's something I've been speaking to astronomers and astrophysicists over the past few weeks about JWST and, and you know those new images and one of the things that I just have to ask them is just for you and your colleagues, that, that there must just be this amazing sense of excitement and anticipation as, as to what these new observatories are, are going to show you. Yeah, I think almost it's disbelief that it's up there, to be honest, because, I mean, I've only been in the field for 10 years and I still remember when I started, people were talking about JWST being up there maybe in 2017, mm. you know, and then it was 2019 and then it was 2021 and then, you know, <laughs> it's just been put back and put back. It's always disbelief that it's actually up there right now. And what's amazed me is the fact that we keep joking that there's no more blank sky <laughs> anywhere you point JWST even if it's at the southern ring nebula you're going to find two ton of galaxies in the background mm. uh, even if you weren't trying and so I think I think with JWST what people haven't quite realized is that as you observe the sky with one instrument so there's many instruments on board there's the imaging instruments there's the spectroscopic instruments there's longer wavelength spectroscopic and imaging instruments right so say one person has said I want to look at this specific thing with the imaging instrument near cam and I want to point it at that specific thing. What we don't realize is all the other instruments are also looking at the sky at the same time, just slightly offset from where that one is looking at, at something completely random. So every time someone goes in with a planned observation, we get four or five other non-planned observations of a random patch of sky at the same time. And I, and so, yes, JWST has been designed for, you know, to search for what's in exoplanet atmospheres and find the first stars and galaxies and the most distant things and look into star, form- star formation regions. But I'm excited for the things that we didn't know to design it to do. <laughs> These unknown unknowns that we have no idea what's going to come out of not just the data that we're planning to get, but all of this data that we weren't planning to get that's going to be captured almost for free as people do their planned observations, which... It's just insane to think about, you know, how much stuff is going to be in there that we don't know yet to ask. And I can imagine in 20 years time when it, you know, eventually might run out of fuel, we'll be looking back going, wow, we we didn't even know what was to come. Absolutely incredible. I, I, yeah, it gives it gives me goosebumps to think about it. So. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, I think that's that's a nice uh, note to end on. That's sort of look, looking forward to the future <laughs> and uh, anticipation and excitement. Um but yeah, Becky, thanks very much for coming on the podcast and speaking to me and good, good luck with the book when it comes out. Um, it's, 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 it's a fantastic you. read and uh, yeah, all, all the best and, and hope, hope to speak to you again soon. Thanks for having me. Mm-hmm.